What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo and Golik. Mike Golik Jr., Mike Golik Sr., and Claudia Bellafato holding it down in the DraftKings studio in Boston. We got a great show for you guys today. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review it. Leave us a five-star rating and check us out live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern right here on the DraftKings Network. Our YouTube channel, Samsung TV Plus, Roku, all those fun places, as well as the best of Gojo and Golik from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern, wherever you hear v on the radio. Fun one today. Claudia, what do we got up on the menu? Yeah, Gojo, and everything's real today. No more April Fools, including yeah. the fact that the Sixers are getting some much-needed help, possibly starting tonight. Embiid back. Keith Pompey of the Philly Inquirer will join us to talk about that possibility against the Thunder. Rocking the Millette UFL center, Alex Millette, on his viral touchdown, and it's Wilder Tuesday. Charlotte Wilder will join us in hour two. But, of course, I'm sure you all know where we're going to start. Caitlin Clark, baby. She got it done. They're headed to the Final Four. A great game, as we all expected, with the win over LSU. 41 points, though, 12 assists, 7 rebounds. What can this girl not do? And when the press asked Kim Mulkey about how to even approach playing a player like this, here's what she had to say. Well, there's not a whole lot of strategy. You got to guard her. Nobody else seems to be able to guard her. We didn't even guard her last year when we beat them. Um, she's just a generational player, and um, she just makes everybody around her better. That's what the great ones do. I think they had a kid that scored 21 and 18. She had 12 assists. Caitlin Clark's not going to beat you by herself. It's what she does to make those other teammates better that helps her score points and them score points to beat you. Um, what did I say to her? I said, I sure am glad you leaving. <laughs> I said, girl, you something else. Never seen anything like it. She really is something else. And there is no game plan against her. It just never works. Gojo, did this live up to the hype for you last night? Oh. Against all odds, yes. Like the fact that this thing, that last year, the matchup we had last April drew the biggest rating that ESPN had ever had for a women's basketball game on their air, on Disney air. Coming into this year, gave us the rematch. Both of these teams even in a position to do this again with all the fanfare going in. And out the gate, Dad, it's not like it took a while yeah. to get going. This first quarter started off shot out of a cannon and never really let up. And Iowa goes out and gets revenge after last year's title game. Like we always say about regular season matchups, it's not a full-blown revenge no, because no. LSU still won the title. Right, right. This one, only an Elite Eight matchup that felt like national championship energy. But, Dad, I think for that reason because of the environment around it, because of the fact that both teams played incredible basketball through the vast majority of this game, this is an overwhelming success. They somehow, in the most difficult situation, matched and exceeded everyone's expectations. That, that was always the in the back of everybody's mind. Is it going to live up? Are there going to be is there going to be foul trouble? In this case, there was a little bit of an injury that we'll get into. But you mentioned we mentioned last year. Last year it was on ABC. The finals nine point nine million. So I'll be yep. interested to see what this one is going to end up, the number is going to be. But for just the fact of when you hype up something so much, that is the first question you ask. Does it live up? And man, I mean, you're right. Right out of the gate, running, gunning, hitting shots. It was amazing. Back and forth. Tie ball game at halftime in this one, 45 all, just going back and forth. It was the third quarter that ended up being the downfall yeah. uh, for LSU. As I said, we, we can get into the the Angel Reese injury in the second quarter. She rolled her ankle. Uh, you know, at that point, she was she was playing very well. I was looking at her, at her numbers. She was five of seven and had ten points. When she or before she hurt herself, two of fourteen after. But I loved how she was demanding the ball in the middle. Didn't have a great scoring night as far as seven seven of twenty one, pulling down rebounds. But Caitlin Clark, not just the shooting. As we're all watching the game yeah. at my house here, she's just launching those threes. It's just it's Steph Curry esque the way how far she launches them. But to see her ability to pass and get her teammates involved as well, just what Kim Mulkey said there. 
was absolutely on point and on display last night. Yeah, I, I said it's, it's Steph Curry range with Kobe Bryant's brain, and maybe that's probably Steph Curry's passing mixed in there too at times because she had it all going last night. Yeah. That hot start that you mentioned for both teams, LSU in the first quarter shot 60% from the field. Iowa shot 55.6% as LSU led 31-26. Clark had 11 points. Reese had her 10 points all in that first quarter before that ankle injury. So... Both stars came to play in a big-time way, and I'm with you. For Caitlin, it was the full variety and versatility of that game. It was heat check shots, left and right, pulling up off the dribble, doing things that we'd really only seen Steph Curry do as a shooter with that kind of range. And then on the other side, for Angel Reese, it did. It was that toughness. It was, yeah. hey, man, she rolled that ankle, went over yep. to the sideline, got on the exercise bike, and said, all right, yeah, we're going to keep this thing moving. Didn't go in the locker room, nothing else done. It was just one player understanding how important she she was to her team and you saw that reflected after the game and the way her teammates came out to defend her Haley Van Lith who we'll talk about Haley's yeah, night and yeah. unfortunately the subject of discussion she's going to be Flage Johnson the same way they flanked Angel Reese and came to the defense of their star player who went out there and tried to gut through this in a game that like you said coming out of that halftime locker room it was just too much Caitlin Clark and dad I think in a day and age I saw it tweeted Someone saying, hey, Kevin Durant, this is what we had wanted. While I don't think that's necessarily fair, this is the kind of sports story that a lot of people look at and go, all right, she got beat badly by this LSU team in the championship yeah. last year, came back with a bunch of new faces on this Iowa roster, but got in the lab and worked to go and try and get over the hump against that very same team. And the fact that it worked out that way, we wish it had been a Final Four or a title, but the fact that it worked out that way at all and went through it is sports movie stuff. Yeah. That it, really is. It really is. You know, and we talked about the threes in, in and all, but some of those 12 assists yeah. uh, were, were amazing as well when you thought she was going to hoist it and she ended up passing to a teammate. And it was the third quarter. As we said, 45 all at halftime, 24 uh, 13 in the third quarter uh, for Iowa. So they took that 11 point lead going into the fourth quarter. Now, LSU did score, I think, the first five points of the fourth yep. quarter. So it was a six-point game early in the fourth quarter, but they couldn't get any closer. Iowa just kept them at bay, uh, kept not, you know, wouldn't let them get any closer. And you start, you started to wonder. We were wondering at that point. Haley Van Lith covering Caitlin Clark. We were wondering, shouldn't Flaugia Johnson maybe be on her? I think she's three or four inches taller. So that's going to be a question going into today as well. But as as Kim Mulkey said, you can't really cover her. But, you know, maybe someone taller would have had more effect. A lot of what-ifs going on after this game, I think. And because Caitlin is such a prolific passer, the what-ifs of, hey, do you double-team her a lot right. sooner than that? Get the ball out of her hands. Sydney Falter had 16 points in this game. Kate Martin had 21 points in terms of the others on right. this team, the right. non-Caitlin Clarks, that were able to step up and be productive on the receiving end of some of those passes. You're right. I don't know if there's a perfect answer for a player of Caitlin Clark's caliber when it comes to how do you go about defending her. Yes, Flaugier Johnson probably would have been the better choice right. overall. I think she had some foul issues as the game went along. And Flaugier, what an incredible yeah. athlete. Some of the yeah. blocks that she had in this game, the tenacity that she played with. But I, I, I got to say, as this game came down to a close... There were so many things that you looked around, whether it was the coverage in the pregame leading up to this, whether it was earlier in the day, the fact that you had Andrea Carter on the A block of first take. I think I saw Richard Deitch point this out. This is not stuff that had happened around women's basketball. Even so long, the whole time you and I worked at ESPN, they owned the rights to women's yep. college basketball in the postseason. So there was the opportunity to do this. But to see it actually happen in the lead up to all this, to see the entire timeline trained on this one thing, I, I was amazed. One of my biggest takeaways was, man, I felt bad for Haley Van Lith. And, and I know P she's a player that a lot of people have opinions on. She's right, someone that's right. been a big trash talker in the past. She left the Louisville team that she was a star of to come over here at LSU. And Kim Mulkey talked about and said, we appreciate what she did. She had to take on an entirely different role here. She wasn't going to get as many shots. It was going to be different basketball than she had been able to play at Louisville. And watching what happens to pro athletes, a lot on our timeline, people getting cooked, people getting made fun of when it's not their night, the way it wasn't for Haley Van Lith last night, who you saw at some point shrug like, what am I supposed to do yeah. against a person like Caitlin Clark? What am I supposed to I found myself feeling bad because I think for me, 
there's still a gap in, hey, college players now getting some of this treatment. You can say they're paid now. You can say that this is semi-professional. I hear all of those things, but I think that was just something I didn't realize was as strong as me as it was last night, watching and feeling some pain for, oh, this person who, man, I hope doesn't open social media for the next month because they were the butt of every joke. The tough part for her wasn't so much that trying to guard Caitlin Clark, because as Kim Mulkey said, nobody can really guard her. She's going to get her shots yeah. off. It's okay it's tough to guard her. She's going to get her points, so help us on the other end, yeah. right? And she faltered there as well. Two of 10 from the field, one of six from three-point land. Yeah. So she wasn't really helping on the offensive end. And there, believe me, there was nobody more frustrated than her For in sure. this situation. And, you know, you just go over social media, which which sometimes you just, you just shake your head. And, and a lot of people just don't like LSU. They don't like Kim Mulkey. They don't like Angel Reese. They don't like Haley Van Lith. They just don't like them, and they're happy they got beat where we're looking at it as a side of athletes to say in the competitive spirit of them. And, and listen, just, just sometimes they rub you the wrong way. Some people think that. You know, everybody has their different opinion about this and are happy that LSU lost because of this. But man, I just saw a lot of people out there giving, you know, doing what they wanted to do and trying to do what they wanted to do. And, and Caitlin Clark just proved why she's going to go down as the greatest shooter in women's basketball history and one of the greatest shooters in men's and women's. It doesn't yeah. matter the sport. She's going to go down as one of the greatest all time there. And she came up big when she had to. Uh, yeah, bottom line. She absolutely did. We can talk more about, I think, some of that emotional reaction. Charlotte Wilder, our good buddy, is going to join us in the second hour here. I know she's fired up to talk about this, and, and I think would be really good on that. You mentioned more of Caitlin Clark's record. She also Ugh. became the all-time, in, in the game last night, she became the Division One career three-point record holder. <laughs> the career uh, NCAA tournament three-point field goal record holder and the career tournament assists record holder all in the game last night. So this was par for the course with what we'd seen with the traveling Caitlin Clark show this season. It is part of what's made her box office television and delivered once again last night. There's a difference between being a great player and then a great player that always delivers when the lights are the brightest. And that was certainly it. And Claudia, it made the task for Paige Beckers, UConn, Juju oh. Watkins at USC – Pretty monumental to follow that one up after last night, but they sure tried their damnedest. Yeah, and we're lucky, too, because we just get another good matchup, like you mentioned with Paige Beckers. I'm looking <laughs> at the odds right now at DK. I was only, only a two-and-a-half-point favorite. I know that UConn's going to be a tough test, but as somebody who made money on Iowa last night, I'd consider that. Let's talk about what this matchup's going to look like, though, because, yes, UConn did take down USC. Beckers, 28 points, 10 rebounds, 6 assists. Three steals, two blocks. So this is going to be another big one. 80-73 to 73 win. This now, UConn, for the first time in NCAA history, two schools with NC State and UConn have both the men's and women's team in the Final Four. So that brings us to the Cash It or Trash It segment, guys. Presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned to hear all that DraftKings has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Agent eligibility restrictions apply. Void where prohibited. See DraftKings.com for details. As you can see, UConn, NC State Futures. UConn, the heavy favorite on the men's side, 195. While the women have the third best odds, 8-1. to one. Nice payout there. NC State, the long shot on both sides. Women and men both at 16-1 to one to win it all. So, Senior, let's go to you. Are you cashing or trashing that one of these teams will win it all? Uh, I, I'm going to trash that. I'm certainly going to trash it on the women's side. South Carolina or North Carolina State is playing. I mean, on the men's side. Or, or, no, the women's side. I'm sorry. North Carolina State is playing South Carolina. Yes. So yeah, I, I'm not, 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 not great. And the other side, if there is a chance of at least moving on to the finals, let alone cutting down the net, North Carolina State against Purdue on the men's side is a matchup we're looking for, especially the big guys, Edie and Burns and that. But then they would still have to probably go through UConn on the men's side to win it. So I'm trashing that one. It's been a great story for both these teams, especially on the men's side as an 11 seed, making it to the Final Four, and Burns being the big story there as we're going to get into as far as not sure. only basketball talk but NFL talk. But, yeah, Mike, I'm trashing that one. I don't think either one's cutting down the nets. Well, if we're cashing or trashing that one of these teams Teams will be cutting down the nets from any of these two here. I'll cash UConn men. I'll cash that in a heartbeat. UConn oh, men yeah. are going to win this entire thing. I think. I mean, and being being on this, they're obviously 
the best odds to do so. They're the current favorite. They walked into this thing as the number one overall seed. So it's the lowest hanging fruit. But yeah, of the four teams here between UConn men, women, NC State men and women, I'm taking the UConn men to win it all, no doubt. And the, that I'm definitely doing, yes. Was I reading the cash or trash it wrong? It could have been. I, well, you know, I mean, yeah, comprehension's it was, it was not strong. You just got your coffee. any of these teams to win it all, but it was, you oh, know. Oh, okay, <laughs> UConn men. When Claudia starts doing the betting stuff, it kind of goes over my head Sorry, sometimes. Sorry, Senior. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I just, I were you, was that where you not listening? Were you reading something else? Were you distracted here? You've been reaching for your coffee already all morning. You ran over at the start of the show to get it. Did you say something? You finally got me a second microphone today. Things are really looking up. I did. I'm just, you know, I'm too busy trying to help the show to have to answer these difficult questions that Claudia is asking me. Okay? I'm sorry. I'll make it more clear next time. Sorry, senior. I appreciate that. Apology not accepted. No, I'm not going to let you attack Claudia again. You bullied her yesterday. (laughs) I'm not going to. I'm coming to defense. We stick up to bullies like you around here. I don't think bullying. I say say spirited conversation Uh that we were having as a back and forth. I I want to have a spirited conversation. I want to have a spirited conversation about what we saw from uh, UConn and Paige Beckers last night because Uh, I I will say this. As a Notre Dame fan all season, our rallying cry, especially down the home stretch in the ACC tournament and into the NCAA tournament, was, well, look at how many players had been injured for Notre Dame. You essentially had a six-person rotation. And it was pointed out in the broadcast some last night, UConn had more people in sweats on the bench than they did in player uniforms on the bench. They had six players out for the season due to injuries. They had about a seven-person rotation last night. And it didn't matter. And it goes back. Janae was on the show with us yesterday and said Paige Beckers might be the most efficient player in the country. And the stat line Claudia read absolutely embodies that. She's someone that was whatever that team needed whenever that team needed it. Well, like like we talk about in a lot of things in this kind of microwave society, what have you done for me lately? And Paige Beckers, after a national player of the year as a freshman, she was on pace to be one of the greats of the many greats that we've already seen Gino Auriemma have at UConn, and she was going to be right there. And then the injuries, the the ACL that knocked her down, you kind of, and and the rise of others, especially a Kate and Clark, uh, Caitlin Clark, but then Angel Reese and this group of freshmen this year. She kind of got put to the side a little bit. And Gino said, "What last week tried to tried to tell everybody, listen, I think I have the best you know uh, player in the country on our team, and she's showing that. And now what a matchup, you know, a former." You know, national player of the year going against, you know, Caitlin Clark, who's going to be the national yeah. player of the year, you know, in this matchup. Another phenomenal matchup. Last year was, or this last night was a great matchup because it was the championship game from last year. But this matchup going to be, ju- I th- could be just as good. And and Gino R.M. even said, I, you know, I, I wouldn't have been shocked if our players ran out of gas. And they didn't. This was another game. Both games were tied at halftime. Yeah. This one was tied 33 all uh, at halftime. So th- this was another really, really good game. And uh, UConn just went ahead. Juju Watkins, the phenomenal freshman, she really emotional after this one. Yep. Really emotional. Just, just couldn't, you know, uh, get that comeback for this one. And UConn, you know, everybody start going, uh oh, looking like the UConn of old a little bit. You know, can Gino have a second run? Remember, in the mid to the teens, they won four in a row. And I tell you who I feel really good for, Mike, is, you know, a workmate of ours at ESPN, mine for a longer time than yours, is Rebecca Lobo, who has seen where women's basketball was, had kind sure. of how they were treated years ago and where they are now and the rise that they have had, not only women's basketball, but women's sports, to be basically front page headline news now. Uh, and she's been through the really the low times of it to now the high times of it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, between her, I, I heard L. Duncan mention this off the top of the coverage in studio with Chanae and Andrea last night, that this was a moment that should be celebrated for all of the women whose shoulders are being stood yeah, on yep. right now, who paved the way for moments like this. Uh, Rebecca Lobo probably needed a police escort out of the building last yeah, night. Slip did. of that jet. Albany Ooh, caught a stray last boy, night in the broadcast. They did, they dangerous. Did. Dangerous. Rebecca, we care about yeah. you here. Uh, the city of Albany probably not going to be inviting you back to speak at the tourism rallies. Yeah, it was based off of, a, she said, Caitlin Clark had told uh, her family, hey, go find something to do in Albany. I'm just going to hang out you know, in my hotel room. And Rebecca Lobo was like, uh, you finding something to do in Albany could be tough or something along those lines. We were at home going, ooh, ooh, ooh. Was, was that somewhere you wanted to go? Yeah, everyone kind of <laughs> heard that in real time and went yeah. the same thing. Even for Rebecca, who yeah. listen, spent her college career yeah. in stores, Connecticut, a place we know well. Mm. Ain't like there's a damn thing to do in the border of Connecticut. No, so this no. is coming from a place of likely personal experience. Yeah. 
doesn't help the folks in Albany who are really <laughs> excited to be the regional that right, didn't right. have three-point line discrepancies or any issues. They just had great basketball to watch there. So congratulations to the Hawkeyes, the UConn Huskies, for rounding out the Final Four on the women's side. We'll get into more of that later. But coming up next, one of the biggest stars in the NBA on the cusp of returning right now. We head to Philly for the latest on Joel Embiid next on Gojo and Golan. Joe and Golik, some much needed help for the Sixers is possibly on its way tonight. Yes, Joel Embiid has not played since late January, but he possibly is back. And tonight, they're five and a half point underdogs at DraftKings at home against the Thunder. To talk about what kind of impact this is going to have, the guys are standing by with Sixers beat writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer, Keith Pompey. Yeah, Keith, we're excited to have you on this morning. Obviously, Philadelphia fans have been getting antsy for a while, hoping for this return. I know as of yesterday in the 130 report, it doesn't look like Joel Embiid is going to play. It was listed as out then. But can you take us through Joel Embiid and the latest on his progress that has the Sixers believing he can be back sooner than later? It, the, the thing about it is Joel and B went on a road trip um, to Cleveland and, and Toronto this past weekend. And, you know, he practiced with the team. From what I was told, um, before the Cleveland game at shoot around, there was a portion of the shoot around where they went over a game plan <laughs> with Joel and B for OKC. And then on Saturday's practice in Toronto, they did the same exact thing with Joel and B. They worked on some things for him, you know, a return to play type of session. So that's where a lot of the optimism has come from. And then not only that, the 76ers put out a video that has since been uh, deleted that I I haven't seen anymore that of Joel Embiid working out. And he was giving the guys guarding them the, the business. So everyone in Philadelphia is excited and, and hyped up about this game because of that. But as of this morning at, you know, a eight, seven 30, uh, he still listed as out for the game. 
So we have seven games left in the regular season as Philadelphia sits in the eighth slot, could possibly move up to seven. A long shot, I think, to get to six, two and a half out of that with, like I said, eight to go. It could happen. Um, do you think, I, I'll ask it this way, what's the percentage you think that Embiid will not play the rest of this season? I, I, I'll say probably 10 percent that he will not play the rest of this season. Um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, he already said that he was going to come back. Now, again, I, I, Mike, I do believe that it could be one of those things where if Joel Embiid comes back and he plays and he's not playing up to the level that he's used to playing at and or if he feels a little bit of, you know, um, pain or anything in that knee that he may decide to shut it down. But in regards to coming back, I do believe that he will come back and play play some games. I, I, I mean, I, like I said, 90 percent that I think that he will come back. But I, I guess it's a wait and see on how he performs and how his knee feels to determine if he's going to re, you know, remain with the team and, and continue to play through the rest of the season. Let's assume everything goes well and he is feeling good. What is this 76ers team capable of then as we turn the calendar to the postseason based on the development of the rest of this roster, Tyrese Maxey, and the crew that had to go to work without Joel, uh, Joel for so long? You know, that's a great question. And, and you know, I, I do believe even if Joel comes back, the Sixers are not going to uh, obtain their goal. Like this was supposed to be the year that they finally broke through and made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. I don't see that happening. I think they'll have a tough time getting out of the first round because when you look at Joel Embiid, you know, not only has Joel Embiid been injured, you know, there's been other guys, their best two perimeter for, perimeter defenders are out, De'Anthony Melton and Robert Covington. And not only that, they lost a lot of toughness in the at the trade deadline. So this team that Joel Embiid is going to come back to is going to be completely different from the team that he was playing with in December when they were like number three in the East. So I don't see it, man. I, I see the 76ers possibly losing in the first round. If they get out of this, out of the first round, I think that will be a major feat for this team, but I don't, I, I see them losing in the first round. If Joel comes back, they'll win a play, they'll win a play in game, but I see them losing in the first round. You mentioned the injuries and where they were before the, this injury. They were in third, you know, one of the top teams in the East as Boston was still kind of running away with things. So, and you mentioned the other injuries as well. But but the main thing is Joel Embiid and his injuries even going forward. So I think we all agree they're really not going to make a dent this year in the playoffs. What's the future for this team? Harden leaves. You wondered who was going to step up. Tyrese Maxey has been phenomenal. But what does this team need to actually get get to those Eastern Conference Finals and try to get to the NBA Finals? You know, it's funny. Several years ago, back in 2017, 2018, they kept saying we're going to be star hunting. But right about now, they got to go star hunting again. You know, the, the funny thing is, not funny, but, um, you know, they, they were talking about saving up a lot of money for free agency. And the one name that keeps coming up is Paul George is a guy who they're very much interested in signing in free agency. And they're monitoring that situation and in, in, uh, in L.A. with the Clippers to see how that goes. Now, the problem is, to me, if Paul George is not available and he resigns with the Clippers, then who else do you have? So while everything sounds great to say, yes, we have cap space, we're going to go out and get people. But if you can't get the person you got, are you just going to overpay? And or what, what else are you going to do? Are you going to push it back? So to me, it's kind of like Paul Georgia bust at this particular time and then see what else you have. But, you know, that's a gamble, I, I feel like. You know, I really do. I feel like it's a gamble. They may have to decide to bring Tobias Harris back a couple other guys back, but, um, you know, I, I just feel like the Sixers aren't, things aren't as rosy as everyone wants it to make it out the scene. Now they will get Tyrese Maxey back. He'll get paid Joel Embiid, but outside of that, it's not as rosy. I think as everybody thinks if they don't get Paul George. Yeah, Keith, I guess the, the big underlying question with that is how much longer do you think Philadelphia can rely on Joel Embiid as the core of this roster the way that he has so far, especially considering the mounting number of lower body injuries we've seen for a guy his size? 
Yeah, and, and that's a great another great question. Um, you know, here's the thing with, with Joel. Like when you're the 76ers, if you look at it, it's kind of like a, that football analogy where you have this guy who, whenever he's healthy, he's like really, really good. Like a uh, like, let's say Saquon Barkley, for instance, right? When he's healthy, yep. he's that running back, and the Eagles are banking on everything for him. Like he's going to help them get a championship. But you know they have that injury history. Joel Embiid, when he's healthy, he's one of these guys that you know that he can. He's the best center in the league, if not one of the top two. But if you trade him, you're not going to get a lot of value. So I feel like this upcoming season, and they're really going to have to take a long, hard look because when you get rid of Joel, you're not going to get equal value for him that you deem equal value. You're going to get lesser players. So basically. You're basically going in a rebuild mode. But to me, y'all, I think the major question is, when does Joel Embiid say, you know what? I've been sitting around waiting for you guys to get me some complimentary players that we can win a chip with. And then it's time for him to say, you know what? I would want to be traded to Miami, New York, or somewhere else. So that's a concern as well. So I think they have to weigh Joel. Joel is weighing them. That's why I think this summer is huge for both sides. A lot on the line, no doubt, for the 76ers as they brace for the return of Joel Embiid. But beyond that, as we've said, a lot of to be determined. Uh, follow him on Twitter, at Pompey on Sixers, and check him out. Doing a great job covering the team for the Philadelphia Inquirer. Keith, we appreciate the time this morning, man. Thank you. Hey, thanks for having me, fellas. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate it. It's... Boy, it gets to be interesting. I agree with the, what we discussed, the timeline of how long Joel Embiid is going to be there. Right. Again, he said, maybe you're looking for a Paul George. Paul George is 33. Find a player to try and get that championship now, right? Because you don't know how much longer you have with Embiid, whether it's you can't find someone to build around him or... Yeah, does he say, I'm going to go to a team that's a little closer to a title? And he brought up the Miami Heat. I mean, remember Jimmy Butler, who was yep. there inside the Heat, yes, the he 76ers yep. building, and then was jettisoned in exchange for others. And ever since then, there's been this looming feeling of what if and what could have been that now maybe could linger and could affect the late portions of Joel Embiid's time in Philly, where he has been one of the preeminent Philadelphia yep. athletes, has understood that city, has known what that fan base loves out of a player. We talked about Jason Kelsey right. in that way, but Joel Embiid, outside of the championship has embodied so many of those same things that Jason helped represent for that city. So again, still out for tonight, but we will wait and see. Coming up next, some tough news for the Kansas City Chiefs as they march forward into their offseason. We'll get to that next here on Gojo and Golik.
Welcome back to Gojo and Golick. Chiefs receiver Rishi Rice is working with authorities in Dallas after a name that is a, so a car, I should say, associated with his name was involved in a six car crash on Saturday. His attorney had this to say after the news came out. He said, on behalf of Rishi Rice, his thoughts are with everyone impacted by the automobile accident on Saturday. Rishi is cooperating with local authorities and will take all necessary steps to address the situation responsibly. Like I said, six vehicle accident resulted in four people injured, two taken to the hospital. Now, regardless of what happens out of the situation, it's just not one you really want one of your best players on this squad to be associated with Gojo. No, certainly not. And, and this is one of those situations where a lot's going to play out legally to determine right. what his actual <laughs> culpability is with everything that went on here. You know, uh, unfortunately, this is something that Andy Reid, as far as players having some off the field issues and his response to them is something that he's pretty well versed in. Andy's a guy who's noted for giving a lot of players second chances in far more extreme right. cases than this. And so it, people always say, you know, you're getting a guy into the right structure and environment to make sure that he doesn't do things like this. Obviously, you can't insulate everyone from everything if he is culpable in this. But this is one of the rare instances, Dad, where I do trust the Chiefs building and Andy Reid and his staff to handle this in the best way possible in a sport that we know doesn't always handle things the best way possible. So the most important thing here is nobody was seriously yes. hurt. I mean, again, uh, two cars racing, six cars end up, you know, in, in a crash and nobody, you know, because the first thing that flashes back, unfortunately, is that Henry Ruggs situation right. where he got in the, was speeding, got in the accident, and somebody did lose their life. Uh, so thankfully, nothing like that happened here. You just, you know, it's just an immediate thought process, I guess, out of the play, out of the people, I should say, that that ran from the scene or left the scene, I should say, because there's video of them running. They were walking away. You just wonder, wh what are you thinking? I yeah. guess you're not thinking that at that point. Like, you really think you're going to get away with that and, and not be found out? And you left the scene where, where, as we said, there thankfully was no death, but there was an injury, and you just walk away from that. That's, you know, it, it's really obviously a horrible look. They'll let the, the uh, as, as Rasheed Rice's uh, lawyers are saying, they're looking into the situation. Yep. The, the, at this point, the Chiefs are saying, you know, we're still waiting to get their president, uh, Mark Donovan, said in all these situations, you have to wait until you have all the facts. And frankly, we don't have all the facts at this point. So they're waiting on that. But uh, the legal process will, will take over here, and then we'll see what the Chiefs do. But again, the biggest thing to me is thankfully nobody was seriously injured. Yeah, exactly. Like you said, yeah. I mean, you mentioned what happened uh, with Henry Ruggs. Yeah. I think of what's going on at the University of Georgia, yes. all the instances all the racing, of late yeah. night racing there yeah. that unfortunately two years ago cost a member right. of that yep. staff and one of the teammates there at Georgia their lives. And so we know how much worse this yep. can be. And so while this is still not an ideal situation, like you said, we avoided the worst possible result of this. And so now we wait for more of that information to come up here, more of what it's going to do, maybe affecting Rasheed Rice's future with the team or not. A lot of that is a, a wait and see mode that we're in right now with this for the NFL. Uh, Claudia, as we turn our eyes to other headlines around the NFL, this is an interesting one for Brock Purdy and a good reminder for everybody how the NFL does work in one specific way. We're all focused on Brock Purdy's contract in the future. We have heard the 49ers brass already say, hey, we know this guy's going to ask right. for the sun and the moon, and at this point he's earned the right to do that, but he also earned the right to get a decent check cut to him this offseason, Claudia, that a lot of guys around the league in his position find their way into. Yeah, if you play well, you'll get paid. Sometimes it, you know, changes on when, but Brock Purdy's going to get paid now instead of his next contract. And this is because the NFL decided to do additional $393.8 million in performance-based pay for the 2023 season. So this is based on playing time and salary levels of players with the intent to give additional money to players who performed beyond their contracts, which I think Mr. Relevant has done. For Purdy, that resulted in an additional paycheck of $739 million, which comes out to 75.1% thousand dollars of the nine hundred eighty five thousand yeah. dollar base salary he made that'd be a lot of money uh in 2023 he set a franchise record for passing yards became the first Niners quarterback since Jeff Garcia in 2001 to throw 30 plus touchdown passes in a season on his way to the first Pro Bowl so like you said go Joe we knew he was going to get paid but now we know he's getting paid now <laughs> 
So, Mike, explain this a little more. Uh, he was 24th on this list of, of compensated money going yeah. out, and he was the last pick of the draft, started every game, and was 24th on this list. So I think there are some people that really don't understand this part of the compensation. Yeah, player performance, it's interesting. I remember when Saquon Barkley and the running backs were having their issues with compensation, issues with contracts. One of the things I thought of was this, the player performance bonus, as a way to kind of create a situation for running backs where it's, all right, if you meet certain thresholds based on playing time in your deal, based on what you're paid, maybe you hit escalators there. Because that's essentially what this is, is an escalator in the contract for every player that makes below a certain salary but plays above a certain number of snaps. Basically, to simplify the formula, it's based on how much money you earned the year prior and how many snaps you end up playing in that season basically for guys that outperform their contract. Right. A lot of this happens. I had buddies of mine that were undrafted free agents that all of a sudden a guy gets hurt in week three and you start the games the rest of the year. Well, based on how you're paid, you weren't supposed to be playing that much. Right. You're not expected to be playing that much. And so when you do, the NFLPA has this as a pool of money that they can kick in to kind of help offset some of that acknowledging, hey, you put your body on a line in a way that's not you know, compensate with your pay at this time. Let's give you a little bit more on that. Brock Purdy, as we've talked about, one of the best bargains in sports still qualifies for that yeah he did so he got that paycheck of seven hundred thirty nine thousand dollars, as i said which was 24th on the payout list this year the top guy was john simpson a guard for the ravens yeah he just about doubled his salary he made nine hundred and seventy four thousand dollars of of compensated extra money there and oh by the way just signed that two-year deal with the jets where he could make up to 18 million dollars so it's worked out pretty well for him so he was first in that. I, th- I think it was uh, Reed Blankenship who was second in nine hundred twenty-three thousand dollars. So when I, I I knew about this and the money they made, but when I saw, like I said, when I saw Brock Purdy was twenty-fourth on the list, I thought, who the hell w- was making more when he was the last pick of the draft and started and performed so well? But as you mentioned, these undrafted guys who end up you know starting and playing and outperforming their contracts. It is just funny though that this comes up because. This is not normally something that you see. A guy that was, what, third in the MVP voting last year? The way Brock Purdy was, who led as many statistical categories for a team that was a Super Bowl favorite for a long time last NFL season. Like That's the part that's not normal, and that's the part that underscores the entire 49ers pro... I won't say problem going into this offseason, but the sense of urgency. Because whatever you think, we've had the conversation a million times over about Brock Purdy's future contract. Right. What happens, no doubt, is team building now changes for the next five or so years when you're the 49ers and you finally do make this decision. You've been able to do things one way for all. And I know Jed York and company came out and said, hey, look what we did for Jimmy Garoppolo. Look how much we paid him. Anytime you have a highest paid player in the history of blank, the devil's always in the details and the details in the Jimmy Garoppolo contract were never that dire for them financially. But they were able to make it work, and it's just a different challenge. And we've seen teams like the Kansas City Chiefs, others that, like you know the Philadelphia Eagles right now who paid Jalen Hurts, having to work in the margins, having to nail some of those other positions, make prudent moves in free agency. That's why the people in the front office get paid good money if they're good at their jobs, and right. we're going to find that out for the 49ers again in a different way than usual. Yeah, and they knew, listen, it's not like they're just surprised by this, right? right. They knew this was coming down the road the way Brock Purdy again played this year. So, and what what you do now is he's going to get a lot of money, but you still try and make it team friendly as best you can. But you can only go so far. I mean, last year he made base salary of nine hundred eighty-five thousand dollars. After next year, he's going to make a lot more than that. Yes. You know, his number is going to go way up, but there's still you find a way to make it as team friendly as possible. Where every couple of years. Uh, You try and restructure it to save more money and give them a big check. Kind of like what they did with Patrick Mahomes. I don't see that kind of deal going on. No, and that only works if you continue to perform at that level. That's The reason that works with Pat is less even the structure of the deal and more just the fact that he's a known commodity. Every year you've gotten the same Patrick Mahomes. It's why Kirk Cousins keeps getting paid because every year you get largely the same Kirk Cousins. We can debate whether that's good enough to get you to your goals 90% of the time when their goals are playoff or above, but you get the same consistency and so allows you to do certain things financially and now for Brock Purdy well he's still been great we will get an answer to a different question of him of what it looks like when more is on his shoulders what it looks like when you can't keep the mom stars together around him and all of that right now secondary to the fact that, that man just got a nice check cut his way we'll be back after this here on Gojo and Golik.
We're back on Gojo and Golik with a Starch Madness update. In case you haven't been following along, you can still vote. We'll talk about the latest voting at Gojo and Golik on Twitter for crowning the fast food champion of the world. Number one McDonald's fries took down McDonald's hash browns, which we really weren't too surprised about. And the sides eat eight region to advance to the foodie four, joining Chick-fil-A spicy sandwich. Right now, though, at Gojo and Golik, you can vote on the dessert eat eight. One seed Frosty against the three seed DQ Blizzard. And I have to mm. say, guys, <laughs> I go with the three seed here. I love Blizzards because you can just throw whatever you want in them. And Frosty's is just a Frosty. Is that a hot take? Ooh. Huh, you know what? It, no, this is a tough one because I was I was thinking in my stupid brain in the break as we were talking about the remaining regions here. The only one we'll have left for the uh, Eat 8 will be the drinks region right. after this. And I was thinking that we've had a lot of drink zerts. Like, that's what the Wendy's Frosty is, is right. a drink zert. You can technically drink it with the straw, although I wouldn't advise that. No. That's more spoon fare. Yep. But it is kind of in that middle ground, whereas Frosty, or um, uh, Frosty, that's, or Blizzard, excuse me, that's tried and true dessert. Yeah. There's no fake in it. This is no slash. This is like in Zoolander. These aren't the slashies. These are the thoroughbreds. And with the McFlurry, that's what you've got. And to Claudia's point, you can make it your own. There's style and variety. It's great. You also have the volatility of will the ice cream machine be working that day that I think runs counter to everything McDonald's dessert fair. Well, I mean, DQ Blizzard, I'm Claudia. Oh, this is DQ. Yeah, my DQ bad. Blizzard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Claudia, I'm with you. I'm going DQ Blizzard. The versatility of what you can put in there. Mm. And then there's just something to me when they show you dessert and flip it upside down. You, you really know? love the upside do. down thing. I, what are you, Spider-Man eating I, desserts? I'm a big fan of that. But I do go with the versatility of it, of so many things that you can get in the DQ Blizzard. Frosty is tried and true. Don't get me wrong. I love it. How about what they're doing right now? I know you don't like it. They have the creamsicle Frosty going on right oh. now. What do you mean I don't like it? I, we talked about it yesterday, and you made it sound like you said, I thought you said, no, I'm not into that. I never once. We didn't talk about that yesterday. Yeah, we did. I remember no such thing, and I certainly don't remember poo-pooing it that way. What I'll say this about the Wendy's Frosty is... Yeah. I'm voting for the Wendy's Frosty here because to me it is the most classic fast food fixture of a dessert that exists. It is something that I look forward to. It's a treat I dangle out in front of myself. And to the point about varied flavors here, I am on record of saying that the chocolate original Frosty is still the best one. They've got vanilla. I had the pumpkin spice one last right, fall. Right. It was a great experience. Not overwhelming at all. So I'd be more than willing to try the creamsicle. So I'm just saying chocolate reigns my, supreme. My, my point, I guess the point is that I, I don't want to speak for Claudia, that we're saying, you're saying Frosty's the classic, but is it better? Yes, I'm right. saying no. it's better. Okay, because you said it's the classic, which I agree, it's a classic, but I'm with Claudia on this one. I go, I go with the DQ it's Blizzard. It's just ice cream. Like, a, a DQ Blizzard is ice cream with delicious candy in it. So, sorry, Gojo, that's probably yeah, one of your the worst The Frosty is like ice cream with a little bit more whipped into it. The consistency is mm. slightly different. It's ice cream. What's mm, understood doesn't different. need to be explained. Real okay. Frosty heads know this one. And so we'll frosty let America heads. vote on this. At Gojo and Golik on Twitter is where they can weigh in. I, I did not anticipate being outnumbered in favor of what I thought was the one overwhelming. I thought... I thought the Wendy's Frosty was like a Yukon men's basketball, like no. juggernaut right now. Like That's minus 800 favorites going through the rest of this tournament. I think yep. that would be the McDonald's fries. Yeah. Oh, Not no, I'd agree. Sorry, I should have meant to said in yeah. this region. Yeah, the yeah. McDonald's okay. fries, certainly that is the UConn <laughs> basketball. We'll try and figure out who the North Carolina State basketball uh, version of this is in our bracket because they have prompted a lot of the discussion, the actual March Madness bracket, and we had some spillover content yesterday, guys, because we had all talked watching NC State upset Duke, moving on to the Final Four, joining their women's team in the Final Four to join one of two schools that sent both teams to both Final Fours. And the conversation around one DJ Burns, our thick king that we pointed out to you guys back in the ACC tournament. Now, I don't think we were as early to market as Stugatz, who hit on that in January. Yeah, he did. Shout out he to did. Mike Ryan on that one. But we got you in on the ground floor pretty early on this one to say, hey, large guy, great feet, smooth mover. You're going to want to check this out. The rest of the world agreed coming off the Elite Eight and saw the feet, saw the size, and saw especially for those of us that come from football backgrounds, a future NFL offensive lineman, potentially. And Peter Schrager, over at Good Morning Football, tweeted out yesterday that he spoke and texted to multiple scouts and GMs about NC State big man DJ Burns as an NFL tackle prospect over the last 24 hours. He's listed at 6'9", which means he's probably 6'7", which is a fair point. Yep, Basketball players often overlist that. A-plus footwork would get a big turnout and potentially money if he participated in the pro day or workout after the Final Four when NC State's turn 
uh, tournament uh, feature would be done. Jim Nagy, the director of the Reese's Senior Bowl, said the same thing. He got texts from GMs, assistant GMs, and college directors within an hour of posting about DJ on Friday night. So, Dad, I, I think this is interesting, and I've seen some pushback from people who say, hey, you can make a lot of money playing basketball over in Europe, if not the NBA, without having to put your body on the line near as much. Certainly the transition from basketball player to tight end, a lot more accessible yes. than to offensive tackle, which is an entirely different world. But I think it's fun that this is getting a little bit more exploration after the conversation we had. I agree. I'm not sure of this. Like you said, we have seen the college basketball players go to tight end because you can vary in weight a little more. You can be sure. in the 230s to the 260s you know, or 270s as a tight end. O-line, I mean, is he truly 275? Is he bigger than 275? Right. The one thing I'll say is I don't know if he's big enough to be an old lineman. And I also heard our buddy Kyle Long say that he thinks because DJ Burns plays with kind of an edge to him that he should go on the D-line. He's saying players that have that edge are mostly on the defensive line. Don't get me wrong. There are some offensive players, and God knows I played against a few, who play with the defensive lineman mentality and try to kill you every single play. But he said overall, I think his attitude makes him more of a D-line prospect than an O-line prospect. That's my only worry on the O-line, Mike, is while he does have great feet, I don't know if he's going to have the size, the girth for a, a tackle position. Cer certainly, I don't think a guard position where you're playing in the phone booth you gotta, a little more. you got to think frame, though. This guy's been trying yeah. to play basketball. He's been doing cardio and conditioning yeah, for basketball, true. and so he's probably not going to hold weight the same way. If you told him, hey, your job is to gain 15, 20 pounds here, big frame. It's like when you see a puppy with big paws. You go, all right, I like what we can do here. We can fill out some and then go from there. And I do think... Post Trent Williams, we deal in a different world on the outside of the offensive line because they showed that video of DJ walking into the arena the other night before the game, and it was him walking next to a guy carrying a boombox on his shoulder, and DJ was leading everyone out. He was singing the lyrics to the song. It gave me flashbacks to Trent Williams with, uh, leading the 49ers out of their locker room in that same way, in a way we don't normally see for offensive linemen where you're allowed to be swagger full and not swagger less for once. How about this? How about if he truly is 275, how about he drops 15 pounds and is a tight end? That'd be cool, too. Yeah. I mean, it'd be worth the shot. It's I, basketball I guys, I'd always think of as great red zone threats. Yeah, like, I, at the very least, you start him there and have him just go for jump balls near the goalpost. I don't know how fast he is. Sure. But, but he's got great feet to, to try and get off the line. It could be, you know, a short to medium range guy. Again, I don't know the speed. But I might almost try that, slim him down a little bit, and put him at the tight end position. Yeah, but why would you want to be slim when you could be a big sexy still? Like, that's been whole part of the appeal. <laughs> He's been a big smooth. He is enjoying it. There's no king. doubt about it. He yes. goes out there and he defies the expectations that people lump on him because of his size, and he balls out with otherworldly athleticism. That's an offensive line mentality right there. You know what I haven't heard? Has anybody asked him? About that, I don't know if anyone has asked. He may him say, that. "You know what? I don't want it. I don't want to do that." I mean, listen, would, would I advise him to? Yeah. Yeah, probably not, because it's you know, it's not nearly as fun. Like, no, I'm sure he you're... could go overseas and make a good living, giving people buckets on the block the way he has, or maybe even maybe this even springboards to an NBA future. Like, I would love to see that right, for him. Right, him get a shot at the NBA, at least get to go play summer league, something like that, get a two way contract and make it happen. I know right now that's not really the right. way that he's thought right. of as a prospect, but things could change. He's had a hell of a tournament run. Maybe this opens people's eyes he has so maybe does he try that because if you bring him try and make have him play football like you do have the practice squad so you can take some time to try and build the player that you want to build it's not like okay what do you got oh it's not working you're gone yeah you, you can develop them yeah, he seems like the kind of guy you might want to stash on a P squad yeah, there and yeah. really start to develop there. I mean, hell, you get him in a building like Philadelphia. We'll talk about the Eagles' future as we go along here this spring and what might be coming up in the draft for them. What have they done as well as anybody in football is taking credible athletes on the perimeter? I think Jordan Mailata coming over right. from the world of rugby, yeah. bring him in there and now turn him into a guy that got a big second contract playing right. tackle in the NFL. So if anyone's capable of doing it, Jeff Stoutland and the Philadelphia Eagles would be the place to go. But this is like when, you know, Know, skill players come on the market and we're like, oh, they'd fit well in Kansas City. We're like, well, yeah, of course. Yeah, everybody, of course they were with Everybody Pat fits well in Kansas City. Let's see how Burns does against Edie first. Now, let's say, enjoy that one. That? Yeah. 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 But uh, <laughs> you know what? I appreciate Peter Schrager and company doing the Lord's work and getting out in, in front of this journalistic process. Speaking of journalists, coming up next, we'll visit with one of our favorites in our buddy Charlotte Wilder as we reflect back on one of the biggest nights in women's basketball history. Next.
Welcome back to Gojo and Golick. Mike Golick Jr., Mike Golick Sr., Claudia Bellafato, and in hour number two on Tuesdays now, which has become the new normal, which is a phrase that I hope we would all leave in the pandemic, but it's appropriate here. <laughs> Because our friend Charlotte Wilder, who normally joined us for Wilder Wednesdays, is now here for another Wilder Wednesday on a Tuesday. She's the co-host of Oddball with Amin El Hassan every day but Monday here on DraftKings Network. Charlotte, you even got theme music now. How about that? I can't believe that. I was like, is that a... Is that a song for me? Is that what's happening? Uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for accommodating me. I, I feel like Wilder Wednesday on a Tuesday is actually more on brand than Wilder Wednesday on a Wednesday. It, I, I, about the song, though, if we were to let you pick your own song, oh, yeah. where would you have gone? Oh, my God, my walk-up song? Yeah. Oh, God. I wasn't, for a question of this magnitude right off the bat that I wasn't ah, prepared for. Listen, I, I, I've been at this business a while. I, I do the hard-hitting questions here, Charlotte. I do the hard-hitting questions. And I've been doing it long enough that I should have a walk-up song answer just prepared. What's popping into my, oh, uh, you know, what's popping into my head right now is like, uh, um, I want to be free by Queen, which I have not heard in a long time, so I don't really know where that wow, came from. Wow! Wow! But like, wouldn't that All be right, a great very walk-up impressive. song? Yeah, that's a good song. I like it's that. It's got a very yeah. different bounce to it going up to the plate here, Claudia. Listen, you've worked around baseball a lot here. Is this something you've always had a concrete answer to? Do you have your preferred walk-up song? See, Charlotte, I felt that same thing you felt when he asked you because I started racking my brain because I I mm-hmm. love all kind of music. To be honest, though, the club going up on a Tuesday is kind of fun. Like, I don't know how much respect that would get, but I, I, I love it personally. So I'll just play cop out here and go with club going up. <laughs> there we go. All right. Stealing that one there. Dad, do you have yours dialed in since you're attacking everyone else with this question? Yeah, it would probably be some sort of uh, uh, Gordon, uh, Lightfoot. Gordon Lightfoot song. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't. R- wouldn't really the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald yeah. going up to bat probably. It's, it's something Charlotte <laughs> would definitely appreciate, but I don't know if that would I'm get the like, crowd. <laughs> how about I, I'm, walking up to, I'm walking up to the plate. Legend is on from the chip <laughs> on down to the big lake they call get your goomies. I'm timed to the, you know, up as I'm yeah. getting it. <laughs> Rotating that your glove in there. Was- snapping. <laughs> this is the most excited I've seen Charlotte in I don't know how long. No, I would love that. I'd be like, oh, my God, he's singing about a shipwreck. Also, that made me think that Desperados Under the Eaves by Warren Zevon would be pretty good. Oh. But also, the only thing that I can think or talk about is Beyonce's Cowboy Carter. But, mm. like, I can't choose. I don't know. what I think I think Bodyguard would be a pretty tough. It would be like, oh, she means she means business. Um, but I'm just completely obsessed with that. Whole, so you really opened up a can of worms, senior. Thanks a lot. And I will say too, because I, I would actually, I, I would definitely do Rage Against the Machine, Bulls on Parade, because I love that song. And every time I go. hear it, I get amped up. So I'm changing mine. Yeah, Bulls on Parade <laughs> definitely makes the workout playlist, and the workout yeah. playlist to batting uh, to walk up song is two Venn diagrams that are basically a perfect circle. So <laughs> now that we've established, we're all hyped to be here, and we're ready for this at bat. Charlotte, I'd imagine this is something akin to the feeling that Caitlin Clark, who claims to never be nervous, claims she slept well before the game last night, everything, and is built different than the rest of us probably felt, leading into what was, I don't know, Charlotte, was that the best women's game that we've seen in the modern era? Is that going to be something that ends up being like a turning point moment that we talk about years later? I don't know how it can't be. I don't know how it can't be. Uh, Because, like, I think, first of all, Obviously, everybody knew the history that we had going in. It was a rematch of the title game. But there was something, um, it felt like there was more weight to it. Do do you know what I mean? It it felt like this was um, almost like a moment where I think a lot of people, from, from what I could tell from my timeline at least, a lot of people in the women's basketball community were sort of like, yeah, welcome everybody we've been we've been telling you forever that this is the sport you know and and it felt like it 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 got a national audience in a way that and it and it wasn't the same as last year because last year there was this feeling i think of um let's see what these people let's see what these women can do and and this year it was like oh we know what they can do like we we've got to see and i'm i'm speaking purely from a a casual fan perspective because if you've been following women's basketball um 
you know, you've known, you've known what we're working with here. I think Caitlin Clark having nine threes was like blew my mind. I'm still trying to find the words to accurately describe what it is like to watch her play because I don't think it's, I don't think it's anything we've actually really ever seen before. And um, as much as I hate to say the words that I agreed with Kim Mulkey afterwards when, uh, at the at the LSU coaches, you know, they caught her in the hallway. She was not at a press conference, but and she was like, you know, they they had Caitlin Clark and and how do you stop her? And she was like, and, and it's not Caitlin Clark alone. It's that she makes her teammates that much better. Um, so I I'm I'm at a loss for words because I felt I I just loved how it made me feel. And then we got another game in in UConn USC and I was just like this is the greatest this is the greatest night of basketball yeah it was and we're still waiting for the numbers on the Iowa LSU game remember last year in the finals it was on ABC and it had 9.9 million I'm still I'm kind of looking to see when the numbers are going to come out yeah uh, uh, from the game last night Charlotte, what happens when – the one thing about pro sports is you can have – if you have a man or a woman who is great or, or players that are, it can be for a while. You know, it's limited in college, and, and we're going to lose, uh, lose Caitlin Clark. We don't know about Angel Reese yet. She hasn't made her decision on whether she's leaving. We do have a freshman class, a few there coming up that are big time. But, but does the game sustain or can go even higher when you're losing someone where, I mean – while the focus has been on women's sports so much now, I mean, a lot of it has been Caitlin Clark, who is, you know, two games away from being done, one game away possibly, but two at the most, of being done in college. Yeah, I I, I think that um, I'm not quite as concerned about Caitlin Clark leaving. I think her going to the WNBA is just going to be great for the NBA. I don't think it's necessarily going to be um, detrimental for the college game. Like, obviously, she was a huge draw, but I think people, four years is a lot longer than I think people realize. Like, four years is longer than a lot of professional players are on a professional team now, if you think about it. Um, there is a, a consistency there, you know, and every year they, they come back. And um, I've been watching a fair amount of, of women's college basketball this season. And uh, throughout the season, you know, if I'm watching different teams or different games, I'm like, oh, yeah, like she's still there. Hasn't she been in college for seven years? And it's like, no, she's actually only been in college for three years, like a normal person. And she'll be back for another. I think the fact that Paige Beckers is coming back, I think that um, if Angel Reese comes back, but like Flauje Johnson is a, a sophomore. Yep. She's yeah. a sophomore. And I heard that and I was like, how like I I knew that cognitively. But I didn't feel I was like, she's got to be at least a junior based on how she's playing and leading this team. And then it's like, no, actually, she's she she won a national championship as a freshman. Um, So I think that the game is in in very good hands. And I'm, I can't wait for for these next for these final four games. I, I think it's an interesting thing to add. Caitlin Clark is sort of a microcosm of what we've seen happen in women's basketball on the large scale. Because I I did the double take last night as they were getting ready for the Paige Beckers-led UConn game against USC in the late window, where they went back and showed the run of four straight national championships that UConn had. My young life was UConn while we lived in Connecticut, winning rampantly in a way that you know people disingenuously outside the sport would say, is this good for women's basketball? And what it's helped beget you on the other side is a sport full of people who raised their game and their investment in the sport to go and match that and now put it in a position where we've got a lot of these teams that are competitive. We've got South Carolina that's built this new juggernaut down in the South versus what we had in the Northeast for so long. And so now you had that. With Caitlin Clark, it's the same thing where you've got this great player who does it with such a style and who has done it in such a way and so public-facing that we've already seen this group of freshmen show up on the scene drawing in star power. And, Charlotte, it comes at a time where because you've got, and this is the one thing we've talked about a lot in the tournament, you've got so many of these athletes in national ads now. So many of these players have become marketable stars early in their college mm-hmm. career. And couple that with the fact that they're so giving of their personality. Flage Johnson's a great example of that is we get to know them now a lot more than we used to in college sports where you know this, Charlotte, whether it's football, basketball, or anything else, 
It used to be the coaches. We'd get to know them and the players were ancillary. The players in helmet sports were difficult. The players in basketball still existed under these figurehead coaches. Now it's the players front and center, both as commodities that brands can certainly use, but also people that we just get to see more often and know better because of that, that I think helps build as many of the next Caitlin Clarks as much as the skill on the court. Totally. I, I, I was thinking about that last night. I think especially with LSU, who has so many players who are doing other things in addition to playing basketball. I think Flauge is obviously the best example. She's signed to Rock Nation. She's a rapper. I think that the fact that um, they are, I was really happy that they made it so far and that they're so good this year because I think it's very easy for, for people acting in bad faith and detractors to be like, oh, we'll see you know, they're doing so much else. That's why they, that's why they're not as good this year. And it's like, no, they're doing a lot else and they're really, really good. And it shows that there is this possibility to be a full person, a multidimensional athlete who is also a student, who is also an artist, who is also, um, uh, uh, just just the fullness of their humanity being on display, which it, it, it was just beautiful. I, I'm, I was, I loved it. We got both sides of that coin because Holly Rowe did a great job storytelling that during the game. They put Flage's schedule up there for everyone to see. This is how much work this person is putting into every part of her life in order to be yeah. this good. Kim Mulkey has lauded Flage with praise about the way she's elevated her game over the last year, where she's also had more off the court opportunities than ever before. So there's been that positive side of you've seen these young business people sprout into basically professional athletes in the way they've got to manage their time. We also saw the other side of that, though. Angel Reese was very candid after the game about how difficult the last yeah. year has been for her. She said, I have had death threats. I have been sexualized. I have been ridiculed publicly in a way that I've had to try and put on a brave face for in front of my teammates, but has absolutely made the last year pretty miserable for me. And I, I know a lot of people are going to do the thing where they say, well, because Angel Reese is someone that wants to talk her talk, it's the double-edged sword of all of that. But I do think we're also now getting to a generation of athletes that's more inclined to let us know hey yeah. this all hurts a little bit and the way that we've all covered athletes for a long time dad the way you were an athlete for a long time there wasn't as much proximity of the criticisms and the person inside the arena there's always been that thought but now you've got such ready access to this people the 24-hour news cycle and social media make it so much more difficult and these people are saying no this this is tough to difficult with. This is affecting us in a way that most wouldn't admit before. Yeah, my era, we just pushed it deep down inside and hit it. Yeah, <laughs> honestly. We did. I mean, we, we did. I mean, we may lash out at somebody in, in not liking what they did, but never was it, you know, you know, I was hurt by this or this affected me. I mean, that was, you know, that was, you never did it. You know, so it, almost you know, it's kind of like the mental health situation as well, where, I mean, yes. I go back to Kevin Love in the NBA to really getting that going. That was another thing in my era. You never, you would never even thought about discussion, discussing. Again, you pushed it down deep uh, and just hit it there. But, you know, we, we've, we've certainly come a long way and, and Angel Reese kind of, kind of let it out a little bit last night. Yeah. I mean, that broke my heart when she said she hasn't been happy since they won a national championship because of the vitriol that's come her way. Um, and then she was like, but I've just got to keep. And she said, you know, I don't stand up for myself. My friends and family do. My teammates do. I think, um, you know, I, I think her teammates, Flauge, was in the press conference. She was saying, you don't know Angel. I know Angel. Angel makes all of us better. Angel is the reason that I'm better. I think Haley Van Lith before the game who who said as a as a white woman in this sport i see what happens to my black teammates and i need to speak up about it and then angel reese is there saying like i don't i don't you know basically saying like it wouldn't do much good for her to constantly be commenting on it but the fact that she did at the end of the season and that she said you know this is um I just hope that the the little girls watching me who basically the people who are here for me just keep watching me do this. Um, and I think that, that that's what I was going to say, Mike. I'm really glad you brought that up because I think with with getting to know these players, with the proximity to these players, with access to them, especially immediately, you know, you can send them a DM for a lot, uh, you know, like you can, you can reach a lot of these people much more directly than you realize. It's, it's not going to a social media manager a lot. It's going to them. And, and it is a real, it is not the player's fault 
I want to say, that they are more accessible. It is everybody else's job not to sink to that horrendous level that that is clearly affecting them. But I will say the players are making themselves more accessible. And and the, the blowback you get is not the player's fault, but the players are putting themselves out there more. And I think they also need, you can tell me if you agree or not, they should understand what's coming their way because what happens when a college kicker misses a field goal? There are death threats. I mean, there are a lot of complete idiots out there. So I think you also need to be self-aware that, all this is coming at you, right? And you shouldn't be. It, it doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It doesn't doesn't mean it's right by any stretch of the imaginations. But there are way more wacko idiots out there on social media because they can hide behind the keyboard who are going to come after you. It'd be nice if it was a situation where this would prompt self-reflection amongst those people, amongst the media and how people cover all these things, the people cover the way that Angel Reese has been talked about. All those things would better serve the sports ecosystem, but dealing in reality, you're probably right, Dad, in that that stuff is not going to change, and it's still, I think, for a lot of these players who are juggling more than ever, Charlotte, and who have all this going on and who are, growing up with social media as a part of their lives, which means they're going to exist there, but learning how to deal with this part of their lives on there as they become young people. Because again, even for professional athletes, you're talking about people in their early 20s when they're handed the keys to a lot of this. Now we're talking about people in their late teens to early 20s at an even more critical part in their development, having all of this stuff seep in and internalize in a way that can be really damaging if you're not careful. Yeah, and and I think, yes, you could say that the athletes have made themselves more available. You could say that they are more out there, they're more accessible. But also, I feel like that is a system that is much bigger than they are and that they are trying to make money in a way that they have not been able to, that can change their lives, that can change their families' lives. So they almost, if they want the reward that come that is possible from this sport now, they have to put themselves out there. Their face is what earns that that the return on, on that yeah. investment. And and I think that um it's we all are in an ecosystem now that is much more intertwined in terms of um, accessibility. So yes, that unfortunately they will have to figure out how to manage the mental health aspects. But I, I, I think that, you know, my sitting here as a white woman and saying, you know, this has got to be hard, like black women and, and that LSU team in particular, as they've talked about it, have this, have to deal with this on a, on a completely different level that I can't even imagine. And so, um, that's where, that's where the systems of this country come into play too, in a way that really watching that press conference, I was just like, it was pretty gutting, I think. So let, let, let me end on this one, at least for, for this section of it, people are, are starting to wonder about keeping score. And I wonder where you sit on this. Uh, the and, and really it would have to do with Caitlin Clark because her game of the first game against Holy Cross set a non-final four viewership record, only to be beaten by her second game when they beat West Virginia. And the last year's title game grabbed 9.9 .9 rating. The men, UConn against San Diego State, grabbed a 14.7. There are people out there wondering, will the women's championship game outrate the men's championship game this year? And you'd have to say it would have to be with Caitlin Clark because she's sure. the draw. Yeah, I, I, and there's part of me that thinks at this point that doesn't really matter. Uh, like no, be, I agree. Be, I be, agree. Be, no, I, and I understand the point you're making that people are going to do this. This is what we do, especially in the media, to kind of show how far it's come, and we've used that in the women's game. But, Charlotte, I think at this point it's become so big in its own right now. We've already established. I mean, last night, Charlotte, the feeling you talked about, in my mind, was the feeling that comes, and this is someone that sat at a lot of blackjack tables. When you put all your chips in and you make that bet on this is going to be the one and it hits, mm -hmm. there's nothing like it. And last night what we got was – Everyone put their chips to the center of the table and said, Iowa versus LSU part two, this is going to be the one. And it was. And watching that feeling of a bunch of young women who were ready for the stage yeah. and the opportunity. I always say luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Preparation met opportunity last night, and they all went out there and made their own luck. And now they have a chance to. Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark, these young women who have been giving of themselves, their personalities, and their game have a chance to affect future generations of the sport forever because of the platform that they just excelled on.
While we've got Charlotte Wilder here, the co-host of Oddball, a great basketball podcast with Amino Hassan here on the DraftKings Network. Uh, Charlotte, we talked to Keith, uh, Keith Pompeo of the Philadelphia Inquirer about Joel Embiid's return coming up here. And I think what Joel and the 76ers are at and the point of some of our more established NBA stars is really interesting to think about right now, the overall health of the league, because as we look around, we know it's because of injury, but Joel Embiid and the 76ers are getting ready for a four, uh, tour through the play-in tournament right now. You've got LeBron James comfortably sitting in the play-in, Golden State sitting comfortably in the play-in. Even the Phoenix Suns have largely existed down in that area after coming together through a big three. What do you think this means as sort of a turning of the page for the NBA right now to see a guy like Steph Curry that I know you guys are talking about on oddball having to sort of reckon with his new place in the league as he's on the way out. Well, I think that that's why we've seen what we've seen from the Warriors this year. I think that's why Draymond keeps having these incidents, why he can't quite stop himself from going over that edge. I think the end is very scary. I think this is clearly we're clearly closer to the end than we are to the beginning. I'm not ever going to say like, with this core, the Warriors, I'm going to count them out. I think that they could be very, very scary uh, in the play-in tournament, given the experience that they've had. I don't think you can ever count that out. But yeah, I think I think we're at a, a turning point here. Um, and it's been sort of fun to see players, you know, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, um, Chet Holmgren, OKC has just been better than better than I expected. I'm not, I'm not afraid to admit it. Um, but I think that it takes a little while. I think that we have been so lucky in this era to have such unbelievable talent for so long. Like we've had LeBron and Steph and Draymond and, um, Kevin Durant and even Embiid now, even Giannis, like for longer than I think people realize. And so there's going to be I don't think Embiid is is where LeBron is or or where the Warriors are, um, you know, in terms of his career. I think he's still got a lot left. I, I do think, though, that these teams are still it's almost the most fun possible situation for a playing tournament because you have so much experience down on the bottom of the standings that anything could happen. And then these guys are so hyper competitive and talented and generationally um, talented that like who knows what happens if they get on a run like that adrenaline kicks in and all of a sudden they're not as close to 40 anymore guys yeah it, it's something we all hope for but not really sure it's going to happen and like you said these are the givens that Steph is on the back nine you know LeBron maybe on the last hole and the Boston Celtics will lose in the playoffs and not get to the championship. So what round oh, do wow. they? Okay. What that's, round? That seemed unnecessary and off topic. I, I, I listen. What are I'm you just doing? Talk, I'm just talking about realities. I'm that just is... talking about realities. When when does it happen in the playoffs this year? Listen. Wow, okay, that was cruel. Yeah. First of all, the, yeah. first of all, wow, senior. <laughs> second of all, um, seriously, yes. Second second of all, I'm an anxious mess. This team, this team makes me so, I'm not going to swear. This team makes me so nervous. This team makes me so nervous, guys. It is hard. I said this on Oddball the other day. Being a Celtics fan right now, to me, feels like standing on the top of a building. And you really hope that someone doesn't push you off. And if they don't push you off the building, then you won. <laughs> My God. That's, wow, it's dark. that's horrible. Well, because it's, listen, we been this team has been so good for so long. This team has made it so far so many times. This team should not have lost to the Miami Heat last year. So the Celtics fans are sitting here and we're like, okay, they're literally the best team in the NBA. They are doing historic things. And then they lose twice to the Hawks last week. And and we're like, oh, okay, so are we just are we gonna do that again? Or are we gonna and and, and I think that I'm I can't believe I'm still talking about losing Marcus Smart in um you know, April, but I do think that there was a, and I think the team is much better without Marcus Smart. Um, but I think that he, he brought a level of, you could latch onto him and, and, and a level of passion that I think sometimes, sometimes I'm like, what, where is that? Like, are you guys, I don't know. What do you guys see as, as not as, um, emotionally connected people in this situation or Claudia well, as a say, very emotionally connected person. <laughs> yeah, I, I am emotionally connected, but to use your analogy, I think the only person that's going to shove them off of that building is themselves. 
Because far and away, right. they're the best talent in the that's NBA. That's got way I darker believe. than I intended. But, but no, but right, if, if that, that's how we're picturing it. Like, they can beat the Hawks. They, they can easily keep off the Cavs. Like, I always go back to that Cavs, how they somehow came back at the end of that game. They always seem to play down. They did the same thing last year when the Magic was terrible. They kept losing to the Magic for no reason other than they take their foot off their pedal or they decide to not play defense, or they rely way too much on the three, and when the threes aren't hitting, they just sort of give up altogether. So I'm with you, Charlotte. I am emotionally invested, but I also think that they are the only reason they're going to get in their own way. Same thing with the Bruins. So us poor Boston fans over here, we're so used to just winning championships easily, but I do think if anybody gets in the way, it's Boston themselves. If you're a budding uh, therapist, move to Boston. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'd say a bunch Jeez. of people on championship oh, recoil. Wow. <laughs> yeah, guys. Ugh, it, but, it, but, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't been so nervous watching a game since that second Hawks game last week. I was just, I was an absolute disaster. And I was like, this is bad because this is a team that has already pretty much clinched the number one spot at the time. They have since, but it was a given. And um, I'm still very anxious in overtime. Uh, so anyway, that's the state of the NBA, Gojo. <laughs> it's, you know what? This all makes me, reminds me of a tweet I saw from our friend Lucy Roden over at the Levitard show yesterday during the Iowa game. Lucy noted all things Iowa fan saying, I'm glad everyone else is having a good time, but watching this happen with your team is among the worst things that you can go through as a fan, which on, falls on deaf ears for most people. Right. As does this conversation where Boston is the only one that can beat Boston right now, much like Chanae said about South Carolina, is going to fall on deaf ears for yeah. most of the rest of the country yeah. that hate you guys because you had that championship parade kid that wandered around with his sign for all those years and gave Boston some of the worst PR imaginable for the rest of the country while you guys were in the midst of winning every championship known to man. But it's an interesting conundrum now because we talked about it in a sea of unknown commodities, I think for the large mm -hmm. part in the top of this year's NBA. Like you've got the Boston Celtics and the Milwaukee Bucks, the Milwaukee Bucks that have recent championship pedigree, star power, a name that people know. The rest of the Eastern Conference, when you look at the non-play-in tournaments, is the Cleveland Cavaliers, the New York Knicks, the Orlando Magic, and the Indiana Pacers. People were still largely getting to know in their current forms in the West. We've talked about it. it's Oklahoma City. It's a Denver Nuggets team that still, even with the recent championship, is a harder sell for a lot of people. The Timberwolves, the Clippers, on and on down the list. It all feels new and different. And then there's the Celtics who have had the same core going back to when they took LeBron James to seven games in the Eastern Conference Finals way ahead of schedule. And now people have known them long enough to not only expect certain things from them on a positive side, but also on the negative side. And so they're one of the few teams that I think comes in on the top end of the NBA playoffs this year, Dad, oh, with yeah. enough baggage for us to identify and go, well, we're going to wait for you to do your part right now, as I think for everybody else, teams like Boston, all those teams Charlotte mentioned in the play-in tournament, they, with their veteran stars, become a good measuring stick and a good brand builder for these other teams that are getting ready to play them in the postseason. We need sure commodities that we know what to expect from so that we can now gauge a lot of these teams that maybe have less capital in the postseason for us I, and they're trying to grow. I feel like Boston Celtic fans are high-end Jet fans. Like, for, like, Kansas... No, no, no. I'll walk with you on this. Hear me out. Like, Kansas City, like, fans think... Okay, how are we going to win this game? Jet fans, the glass is not half full. It's cracked and leaking. But Celtic fans, it's okay. We know we have a great team, but when we get to crunch time in the playoffs, it isn't, it isn't you tell me if I'm wrong, isn't it more how are we going to lose this thing over how are we going to win this thing? Oh, wow. Oh, See, my God. you're really going to fight today, aren't you? Hi, and just <laughs> listen, you're not wrong. It's a feeling of, I think the way I would describe it is instead of a feeling of, of euphoria, it's a feeling of relief when there is a victory. And I hope the right. euphoria comes if at the end of this, the Celtics are standing there holding the Lombardi trophy. I mean, Lombardi, the Larry O'Brien. <laughs> this is what you've done That'd be to something. me. That'd be something. If, if they trip. now pull off the Lombardi, the you Celtics really have Charlotte thinking Jets, like a Jets fan. <laughs> The Celtics That's true. could beat the Jets. Oh, embrace, <laughs> embrace debate. Coming up on first take, Celtics, Jets, three-game series. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, welcome back to Gojo and Golik. Mike Golik Jr., Mike Golik Sr. And Dan, in addition yes. to all the March Madness that we've had going on, spring football also yes. back right now. The UFL got going this past weekend, the now merged USFL and XFL. And we didn't have to wait long for maybe the play of the year to happen in weekend number one. And that came courtesy of the San Antonio Brahmas and Alex Millette, who joins us now, an offensive lineman for the Brahmas, who was on the receiving end of an incredible special teams fake play. Brad Wing, the former Giants punter, lofts a 40-yard dart down the field to an interior <laughs> offensive lineman getting loose as one of the ends on the field goal protection unit. I love the yards after catch, Dad. This play had everything. And so we now invite in Alex Millette, kind enough to join us here now. And, and Alex, first off, congratulations uh, on the play of the weekend to start this UFL <laughs> season. Take us through that here because I've heard conflicting reports. Was this play designed for you? Were you just one of the options on this play? What was the install like for this fake that ended up turning into a highlight? Well, absolutely was not. Uh, the ball was not supposed to go to me. Uh, it was a one read play. <laughs> uh, fake field goal was supposed to go to our tight end coming back across the field. But I, uh, um, the DB lined up against me when we spread it out the formation. The DB lined up against me, and then he looked around and then went and guarded our kicker. And then I was just scot free. So I ran down the middle of the field and saw myself wide open. So I just kind of settled down and Brad threw me a dart. And I, once I caught it, I felt no one around me. I was like, I'm going for gold there. <laughs> <laughs> so, first thing I want to ask is when you guys practice this play, have you ever been thrown the mm -hmm. ball when they practice this play? Not a single time. No. <laughs> Wow. Wow. I thought just for fun, they said, let's throw it to the lineman and see if he can catch it. So this was the first time. And the other thing you always see when receivers break open, if somebody misses a coverage, they throw their hand in the air. Did you ever think about throwing <laughs> your hand in the air because you were so wide open? Say, get me the ball. I thought of it. I thought about it, but I'm kind of a, a bigger target than usual. So I figured I didn't want to. <laughs> Kind of wanted to hide in plain sight there, and see. <laughs> so see that's the offensive lineman mentality right now. The zig when everyone else that's is zag so there. Good. He knows he needs to make himself less seen. And, and, and now the play happens. So in all seriousness, Alex, it was a ton of fun to watch. I'm a big fan of the fix six. Anytime an offensive lineman gets loose in the end zone here, for you overall though, this attention now coming as you guys get started with this, you've got some experience before in spring football with the XFL. You're obviously a guy that had some background in the NFL too. What has this experience been like with this now newly formed league going into this year? Well, it was awesome to be a part of the XFL last year. Um, but this league is kind of the same. There's, you know, it's different, you know, since they merged both leagues, you know, last year I thought the XFL, there was a lot of good talent where um, now it's even better because, you know, we had two separate leagues with 16 teams and now you only have eight. So guys that were on teams last year didn't, weren't able to make the cut this year. So um, I think the competition level is bigger. And, you know, I think it provides us with a great opportunity to um, try and get back to the league. And, um, and I think it's a big deal um, for a lot of guys, you know, whether guys have first year out of college or like me second, you know, so on guys that are on the later half of their career, just trying to get back on a team. I think there's a lot of opportunities in this league and I think it's really well designed. So let people know how this works a bit. There are certainly some players who are playing knowing they, they aren't going to play in the NFL. And there's plenty of players like yourself that are looking to get there. You know, you were in off season with the Colts and with the Lions. So how let people know how it works while you're playing. Do you or your agent hear from NFL teams that say, you know, when this season is over, we want you. How how does that process work to try and get to the to the NFL? Well, last season, um, my agent and uh, my GM for my team were hearing from teams a lot. Um, so that, you know, constant contact with them, kind of like, you know, you're a free agent, you know, just saying when the season's over, trying to get and um, signed to a team, trying to get tryouts, workouts and stuff like that. Um, this year, I haven't. I haven't heard anything yet, but the season just started. So I'm sure, um, you know, as the season goes along, you know, teams will be calling about um, guys on my team, um, hopefully myself too. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I think there's just constant contact with that. You know, obviously I, we can't go anywhere during the season, but um, after the season, it's the goal is to have something set up or somewhere to go um, as soon as possible. 
I'm curious for you the day to day. I so I played in what was the FXFL, a side league that tried to form back in 2014, and it was much smaller scale. We weren't very well funded. What's the experience like day to day for you guys? You've been around NFL buildings and in NFL locker rooms and seen the things afforded to you there. You played your college ball at Marshall, which obviously is established, but what's it been like in this new league as far as the day-to-day experience for you as a player with all the things that you need just around the football in terms of training staff and the weight room and all those other things and resources available to guys? I mean, obviously it's going to be different than the NFL. The NFL is a multi-million dollar okay. business, but I'd say it's a little bit of a mixture between the, um, um, the NFL and college. You know, you have everything you need. You have... Um, the trainers, the support staff, um, everything you need. We have great coaches in place. Obviously, I get to play for a legend, two legends. I mean, that I directly coach yeah. Phillips and then my uh, O line coach, Andre Girard, who um, was a five time Pro Bowler. And, um, but yeah, I think we have everything we need. I think we're really well taken care of. And I think um, this league has a, has a huge chance to be the spring league that sticks around for a while especially if we continue to uh, um, put out great athletes. I completely agree with that and hope for that. I mean, it's the one pro sport we're talking about that doesn't really have that feeder system, that minor league, and hopefully this is it. And really, you know, it, it usually the things uh, Dwayne Johnson, the rock touches usually turns yeah. to gold. So hopefully that does work as you were an all XFL teamer last year. By the way, have you gotten a picture with him, or maybe he was in the workout room with your your offensive lineman? Ooh, yeah. Any of that go on? I have not gotten a picture with him yet, but you know, I'm still holding out for the rest of the season. Hopefully, uh, he shows up at one of our games, and I can get get a picture with him because you know I've been I've been um, watching him since I was a kid on WWE and uh, and uh, all the way to all the movies he's been in. So, growing up as him being a star since I was a child, it'd be awesome to get a picture with him. Get to know him a little bit. Yeah, it, it's been cool to see him bring his background yeah. and all that star power to this league, and it's part of a reason in addition to, like you said, the great athletes that are going out there and getting it done, the guys who will hopefully make their way back onto NFL rosters, and so you have these success stories to point to here. Alex, before we let you go, I guess the other question that's going to be on everyone's mind now is, are we drawing up more plays to get you the ball? Is this something where now you can go to Wade Phillips and say, all right, coach, listen, you've seen what you've got here under the hood as an athlete. Now what's next? Um, you know, I hope that I get some more plays drawn up, but you know, as an offensive lineman, that's not something I'm going to hold out on because, uh, because as a no lineman, you don't really, I wasn't expecting to get the ball in the first place. So if it ever, if it ever happens again, especially twice in one season, I'll be pumped about it, but I'm not expecting anything else after that. You know, I was, that was probably the best thing that could have happened to me at that point. (laughs) So I, I really do want to know, I heard what you said before about it, but when you caught the ball, it was the 15-yard line. When you turned around, in all seriousness, what was your initial thought when you were still 15 yards away from the end zone? Well, I kind of blacked out. I honestly I honestly <laughs> thought I caught the ball on the five-yard line, took two steps, and <laughs> dove. I did not know I caught the ball on the 15-yard line, and I didn't know until they replayed it. We were at halftime walking out, and I was like, dang, I caught that ball on the 15-yard line. So it was... Um, <laughs> It was, yeah, I had to watch it back to really remember what happened, in all honesty, because, and then obviously I didn't really know how to celebrate. My first reaction was just spike the ball. I think that was just the best thing I could have caught, uh, came up with, so. <laughs> hey, you know what? Spike the ball and yeah. then go celebrate with your brothers, because when one offensive lineman scores, we all, every we all offensive score, yeah. lineman <laughs> scores. And so <laughs> congratulations on making it to the promised land. Congrats on a great start. Uh, to the UFL season here. And best of luck going forward. We're excited to watch you all, guys, and hope it all works out for the best for you. I appreciate it, and I hope I can count on you all to be Brahmas fans now. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I think we have to now officially take the Brahmas as our team. So, yes, we'll be Brahmas fans from here on out, and we'll be rooting out Alex Millett and the rest of his teammates. Thanks, brother. We appreciate it. Appreciate it, man. Have a good one. I All right, this is this those, is nice. Now we actually we, gotta get some we had Brahma a team stuff. picked for us, and you're right. Yellow and black should work well for us. I think we can be Brahmas. He pulled the Will Ferrell. I blacked out. <laughs> honestly, that also might be an oxygen deprivation yeah. thing. That's a lot of running for an offensive is, lineman on one play, is. and so the cardio, the ability, all on display for Alex Millet.
All right, time to finish off the show the way we always do. This, that, and the third. Three quick stories to send you into the rest of your day. As always, download, subscribe, rate, review us. Leave us a five-star rating and check us out here live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern on the DraftKings Network. You can also catch the best of Gojo and Golik noon to 1 p.m. Eastern wherever you hear VEASAN on the radio. And if you missed any of the show today or our great guests, our thanks to Keith Pompey from the Philadelphia Inquirer stopping by to talk about Joel Embiid, Alex Millette, star offensive lineman for the uh, San Antonio Brahmas in the UFL, and of course our buddy Charlotte Wilder from Oddball with me and El Hassan joining us all here today. You can catch that wherever you get your podcast or right here on YouTube as soon as we get done with the show. Guys, let's start with this. Yesterday sucked. April 1st, a.k.a. April Fool's Day, yep. has become an absolute nightmare in yep. the modern era. I have maintained that any insider, NFL, MLB, NBA otherwise, <laughs> who participates in this day should be jailed for at least a day, if not suspended from their place of work, because we trust you in a day and age where there's very little we can trust online. But we had a bunch of athletes decide to jump in and get in on the action yesterday here. Which of your these retirements, these fake retirements, I should say, was your favorite, Deb? We had con- Quandre Diggs out here, Justin Reed, Cam Rising at yeah. Utah was getting right on the action, who's been there for like eight years. Matthew Judon for the Patriots fans in the Zoom chat here decided to scare the hell out of everyone. Dad, who's your favorite? Well, listen, on no, I, I don't get fooled on this day. A, I don't, I don't really tweet. I just repost. And yesterday, I only reposted from like Go Joan Golick account. I'm not getting trapped. I'm not getting caught. You've gotten caught in the past, have you not? I've gotten caught by like a darn shirfter, but that's not April Fool's worthy right, right. because I think yeah. everyone kind of adopts your mentality Listen, on April if, Fool's. If you get caught on April Fool's, it's your own fault, right? I mean, you got to know the date, you got to know what's going on, and you just can't let yourself get caught. I mean, Charlotte, how do you feel about this one as a person who lives much more online like I do dealing with this crap? Uh, well, I'm pretty gullible as it is. So April Fool's has like always been my nightmare. Um, but I think that. I don't believe anything on the internet anymore. So every day is kind of April for uh, April fools. So I guess I've gotten much more cynical, you could say, but um, I don't think that, I don't think that doing fake retirement posts is good um, energy for players. I would not do this if I were them. I do not Mm. think I would not be met. I would not be playing with the forces that are greater than I am about how long I have left to play. I, 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 Matthew Judon's when he put, he said he was joining equestrian show jumping. I was like, okay, cute, funny. I wouldn't put that out into the universe, but go ahead. So uh, maybe they're just a, a little less superstitious than I am. I just, I was like, no, couldn't be me, you guys. Don't you know what they say, that. once it's in your mind. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, no, you know, I say you're manifesting it. some weird stuff. Yeah. All of a sudden, the team's like, oh, maybe he is thinking about it. Maybe the, t- I mean, you got to let the team know before you do something you like would this, think right? So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, my God, imagine being a GM of one of these teams and you open up Twitter and all of a sudden see this guy that you probably just paid a boatload of money to Retire. all of a sudden wants to go ride horses for a living. What? There is a person that we all, go ahead, Claudia. No, I was just going to say, I saw it because an NFL account retweeted it. So I actually oh. thought the Judon thing was real because they just did, you know, like the, the Patriots. Back. It looked very legit. And then I saw the horse picture that he posted. So then I knew it was a joke. <laughs> the, but it scared the crap out of me. <laughs> the other one for the person that we all know, and actually my wife, Chris, your mom, actually thought this might be true. I mean. This was ABC7 New York breaking. Stu Gotts is leaving the Dan Lebitard show at the end of the year to join the fan sports radio in New York. By the way, that was not actually ABC no, Seven was New York. It was an account that made yeah. that its handle for the day. Yeah. Sorry, but that is yeah. incredibly that believable is, considering yeah. how much well, Stu got flirts say, with like, them and everybody else. That's, yes, that's Stu's dream. So you know, we, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Stu got probably opened up Twitter. He's like, finally, yes. Oh, let's go. Oh, he was oh, celebrating yeah. at home. <laughs> oh my God. So yeah, uh, you monsters <laughs> out there participating in April Fool's Day. Lay off. I'm glad this is in the rearview mirror. Claudia, let's get to that and something real that's actually happened and not any more of this fantasy land stuff. Yes, baseball's back, which makes me very happy. We also got our first no-hitter of 2024, and it's a really interesting story because Ronel Bronco, uh, Blanco, I should say, entered the majors at 28 years old. He's now 30. Never pitched more than six innings, and he threw a no-no against the Blue Jays in just his eighth career start. <laughs> He also just had a baby five days ago, which is great. So life is good for him. But to me, it's just so cool imagining how hard you've worked for this. And you know how baseball works. Working up to the majors is brutal. 
So entering at 28 years old at 30, eighth major league start, and he throws a no-no. Taking advantage of the opportunity. Within, within five days, you did something in your eighth start that's the second greatest thing in your life, right? Because you just had a baby. So that, yeah. that's got to I mean, be number he one. Didn't, he didn't have Well, I know. You know what I mean. <laughs> he what do you think do I'm it. an idiot? I mean, I he's, I'm he's just saying, of, you're the one that usually always Part makes of the duo that, that, you know, that now have a child, you would imagine that would be number one. Where normally, man, throwing a no hitter, especially a guy with the least experience like that. I think of it, Charlotte, as he also did this sleep deprived because there's no chance, even if his wife, who already, again, you know, wife or I should say spouse, significant other, whoever he had this child with here, they're probably doing the lion's share of the work in season already, especially being the person that just gave birth. But I'd have to imagine at some point, there's something that's going to affect your sleep cycle. The baby crying, baby. maybe? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, Charlotte, to me, this just ups the degree of difficulty. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of these people probably have uh, help out the wazoo, hopefully, if you're making that much money and you need sleep that badly. And even that five days after, I think maybe this is his secret sauce. Maybe he didn't know that he just needs to, you know, force himself to stay awake. And then, Claudia, maybe this is the start of, like, a bajillion no hitters for this and guy can, because I'd love to see it for him. <laughs> then he'd make a lot more money. <laughs> Exactly. And you know what? Listen, di as the one thing I have learned with a brother and sister who now both have children of their own, diapers are expensive and they get used a lot. I had not realized how much kids poop. It's insane. Yeah. They're just always oh, yeah. pooping. When you're wh whatever you think you do the most in a day, these kids poop more than that. It's insane. And I'm not changing diapers. What That's the one place Uncle Mike draws the line. What I will say is you've been now at my house for two days. You poop more than a baby. <laughs> I'll say that right now. Hey, you know what? No one has to help me, though. Like, I still, I draw the line. I'm not, ch someone asked well, me the other day. They like, did oh, at one point, Mike. My sister, she's got a, they did at one point, and they will again. Like, I wiped getting, your butt. We're getting close to that with yeah. the big guy over here, where at some point we're going to have to take him out in the, in the yard and just hose him off Whoa, there. whoa. What that is that? The people at the home will do that. I'm sure they'll do a great job. No, I'm living with somebody. You, Someone's taking care of me. Yeah, the people in the home are taking care of you. <laughs> Mom will come stay with one of us. She, she can take care of herself, but. We can't trust you like see, that. See, see, see. Uh, we move on. Yeah, you know what? Speaking of someone else who is deciding to he's head into retirement <laughs> right now, and I don't know if he's moving into a home, Claudia, but Rajon Rondo has announced that he's at least not oh. going to be playing professional basketball anymore. You guys get so graphic with that topic, always, no matter what. Uh, yes, Rondo is retiring. Who is graphic? <laughs> he announced on Monday. After 16 NBA seasons, I always love watching him with the C's. He talked about this on an appearance of DKN's All the Smoke podcast. He said he is absolutely, quote, absolutely done playing in the NBA, citing his desire to spend time with his children. Everybody needs family time, especially after a career like Rondo had, guys. Yeah, a, a, an incredible career. It was great hearing him. I think recently referenced by LeBron James on that podcast with J.J. Reddick talking about the smartest players he's ever been around here. And Charlotte, guys, certainly that means a lot to you and folks in the Boston area for what he helped give to that squad for so many years. Oh, hugely. And um, he we interviewed him on Levitard recently when I was down in Miami. And the way he talks about basketball, it it your head is spinning. Um, and I think it's great. He's going to have more time to to coach his kids. I know he's he's very involved. So, congrats to Rondo. What a career. What a what a run. 38. That's a good. That's a long time to play basketball yeah. professionally for. Mm. Yeah, I mean, 06, he came in the league to 14. He played with the Celtics. Then he jumped around a bit. He ended up playing for nine teams, the Lakers, uh, two stops with the Lakers. So uh, he, he went around the merry-go-round a little bit after leaving the Celtics. But heck of a career, without question. Finished up with the Cavaliers in 22. Remnant of a bygone time, a true point guard in terms of high basketball IQ, incredible yeah, distributor, yeah. just never had much of a jump shot to speak of. And so it always kind of hindered what other teams had to account for <laughs> defensively. But there's no doubt when you hear his peers, and to Charlotte's point, the way he talks about basketball, one of the greatest minds the sport had during this era, and someone that now gets to enjoy the peace and quiet of life after basketball. We hope you have all enjoyed the complete opposite of peace and quiet here on this podcast. <laughs> if you enjoyed it, download Oddball with Charlotte Wilder and me and Al Hassan. And of course, download, subscribe, rate, review our podcast. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow.